The armed wing of Hamas, Al-Qassam Brigades, claimed to have repelled an attempted hostage rescue by Israeli special forces in the Gaza Strip. According to the statement on Telegram, the Hamas fighters attacked the special forces unit, resulting in several military casualties. Hamas reported the death of a captive Israeli soldier, identified as Sayar Baruch, 25. Israel has not commented on the specific incident but accused Hamas of engaging in psychological warfare. The Israeli government holds Hamas responsible for the safety of the hostages and reiterated its demand for the Red Cross to visit them. The United States vetoed a United Nations resolution for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. The vote in the 15-member council was 13 to 1, with the United Kingdom abstaining. The U.S. deputy ambassador criticized the council for not condemning Hamas' October 7 attack on Israel and argued that halting military action would allow Hamas to continue ruling Gaza. The resolution had nearly 100 co-sponsors, but the U.S. veto sparked disappointment among other nations, with warnings of more civilian deaths as the conflict enters its third month. The Palestinian UN ambassador accused Israel of seeking the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, while Israel's UN ambassador asserted that peace can only be achieved by eliminating Hamas. The UN Secretary-General invoked Article 99, warning of a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. The health crisis in Gaza includes widespread destruction, displacement, and a collapsing health system. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has called for an immediate end to the war in Gaza and proposed an international peace conference to establish a lasting political solution leading to the creation of a Palestinian state. Abbas advocates peaceful negotiations over armed resistance and expressed a willingness to revive the weakened Palestinian Authority, implement reforms, and hold elections. He emphasized the importance of East Jerusalem's inclusion in elections, as Israel's objection led to the cancellation of planned polls in April 2021. Abbas criticized Israel for not fulfilling its pledges to end the occupation and highlighted the need for international support for Gaza's reconstruction. He placed responsibility on the United States, stating it is capable of ordering Israel to stop the war but has not done so, characterizing the U.S. as an accomplice of Israel. Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, Prince Faisal bin Farhan, emphasized the urgent need for an immediate end to the fighting in Gaza during a press conference in Washington. He expressed concern that stopping the conflict doesn't appear to be a top global priority. The focus should be on halting the fighting, increasing humanitarian aid to Gaza, and overcoming bureaucratic obstacles limiting aid access. The UN Security Council delayed a vote on a humanitarian ceasefire, and the US opposes an immediate ceasefire, favoring pauses to protect civilians and address the aftermath of a deadly attack by Hamas on Israel. Jordan's foreign minister warned that a failure to pass the resolution would allow Israel to continue its actions. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas also called for an end to the war in Gaza and advocated for an international peace conference to establish a Palestinian state. The Biden administration has requested Congress to approve the sale of 45,000 shells for Israel's Merkava tanks, valued at over $500 million, for its offensive against Hamas in Gaza. The potential sale is not part of Biden's $110.5 billion supplemental request but is under informal review by congressional committees. The State Department is pushing for quick approval, facing objections from rights advocates concerned about the use of U.S.-made weapons in the conflict. The administration is considering using emergency authorities to bypass committee review for a portion of the ammunition. The U.S. vetoed a U.N. Security Council demand for an immediate ceasefire, further isolating Washington diplomatically. Amnesty International linked U.S.-made weapons, including joint direct attack munitions, to Israeli airstrikes on civilian homes. The death toll in Gaza has risen to 17,487, with concerns about civilian casualties and U.S. complicity in war crimes. Israel launched the campaign after a Hamas attack on October 7, leading to increased scrutiny of U.S. weapons use in the conflict. The United States imposed sanctions on 37 individuals from 13 countries for human rights abuses ahead of Human Rights Day. The sanctions, coordinated with Britain and Canada, include visa restrictions and asset freezes. Among those targeted are two Iranian intelligence officers accused of lethal targeting of U.S. officials in retaliation for the killing of Quds Force Commander Qasem Soleimani. Taliban members were sanctioned for their roles in repressing women and girls, and two Chinese officials were cited for connections to human rights abuses in Xinjiang. The U.S. also restricted imports from three Chinese companies over forced labor practices. 
Republican lawmakers criticized the China sanctions for not targeting senior officials, including the Chinese Communist Party chief in Xinjiang. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen emphasized the commitment to promoting accountability for human rights abuses. The sanctioned individuals also include leaders of the Islamic State in the Democratic Republic of Congo, heads of criminal gangs in Haiti, and the Commissioner General of the Uganda Prison Service. The U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was targeted with approximately seven mortar rounds during an attack, marking the largest attack of its kind in recent memory. U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria were also attacked with rockets and drones at least five more times on the same day. No group claimed responsibility, but Iran-aligned militias, operating under the banner of the Islamic resistance in Iraq, have previously targeted U.S. forces. The attacks caused no injuries, and the embassy suffered very minor damage. The U.S. has responded with strikes, killing at least 15 militants in Iraq and up to seven in Syria. The State Department called on Iraqi security forces to investigate and arrest the perpetrators, emphasizing the non-negotiable right to self-defense. Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al-Sadani pledged to pursue the perpetrators, describing them as unruly, lawless groups. Militia leader Qadib Syed al-Shahada rejected stopping or easing operations while Zionist crimes continue in Gaza. The attacks pose a challenge for al-Sadani, who aims to focus on the economy and attract foreign investment, including from the United States. Former UK Prime Minister David Cameron urged the US Congress to approve billions of dollars in support for Ukraine in its war against Russia, emphasizing that failure to do so could embolden Russian President Vladimir Putin. Senate Republicans recently blocked $66 billion in emergency aid to Ukraine, raising concerns that US funding to the nation could dwindle amid a partisan stalemate. Cameron expressed worries that Western nations may not do enough to support Ukraine. He emphasized that the passage of the aid package by Congress would have a significant impact, encouraging other European countries to join in supporting Ukraine. Russia launched a fresh barrage of missiles into Ukraine, killing at least one person, though defenses prevented any from reaching the capital city, Kiev. Ukraine's military reported downing 14 out of 19 cruise missiles fired by Russia from strategic bombers within its own territory, marking the largest such attack since September 21. Debris fell on some private homes in the region around Kiev, resulting in at least one person killed and four others wounded. The attack occurred amid daily shelling of areas closer to the front lines, with one civilian killed and another wounded near Kupiansk in the eastern Kharkiv region. Russia's forces also targeted the city of Kharkiv with S-300 air defense missiles, injuring several people and leaving 16,200 households without electricity. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has lasted for over 21 months, has resulted in intelligence estimates suggesting that the number of people killed or wounded is in the hundreds of thousands. The UK Ministry of Defense estimates that between late February 2022 and November 2023, official Russian forces suffered up to 240,000 wounded and 50,000 killed, with Wagner Group mercenaries experiencing additional casualties. While Ukrainian civic groups report 24,500 confirmed combat and non-combat deaths, the actual figure could be much higher. The strain of the prolonged war is likely to have significant implications for both Ukrainian and Russian societies. The Ukrainian parliament has approved four bills necessary for starting European Union accession talks, including one addressing national minorities' rights, a crucial demand from Hungary, which opposes Ukraine's EU bid. The bills were signed into law by President Volodymyr Zelensky, who described them as a key step in Ukraine's application to join the EU. The EU summit next week will consider whether to begin negotiations on membership with Ukraine, and the unanimous approval of EU leaders is required. The minority rights law addresses concerns raised by Hungary regarding ethnic Hungarians in western Ukraine, particularly in education. Donald Tusk, leader of the Polish Civic Coalition, KO, and Viktor in recent Polish elections, accused Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban of aligning with Russian positions openly. Tusk stated that Orban's relationship with Moscow is organic, highlighting Hungary's obstruction of EU funds for Ukraine and its opposition to sanctions against Russia. Despite the differences, Tusk expressed an intention to use various arguments and methods to mitigate the negative consequences of Orban's stance. Orban has maintained close ties with the Kremlin and has been criticized for not providing military aid to Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced his intention to run for re-election in 2024 during an event for army personnel. Putin 
who has led Russia since the early 2000s, is seeking a fifth term and is expected to face no major challengers. His decision comes amid the ongoing military offensive in Ukraine, and his re-election would extend his rule into the 2030s. Putin's critics argue that previous elections have been marred by irregularities, and his main rival, Alexei Navalny, is currently serving a prison sentence. The election is scheduled for March 15 to 17, 2024. French President Emmanuel Macron hosted Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban for a working dinner at the Elysee Palace to discuss various issues, including European support for Ukraine, ahead of the EU summit next week. The EU aims to agree on new financial aid and the initiation of EU membership talks with Ukraine during the summit. Orban has threatened to block key decisions on Ukraine and proposed postponing discussions on additional financial aid and membership talks. The meeting comes amid concerns that Orban could obstruct crucial decisions at the EU summit and Macron intervene to address the deadlock. Orban has faced criticism for his close ties with Russian President Vladimir Putin and reluctance to fully support Ukraine. The Danish parliament approved a bill banning the inappropriate treatment of religious books aiming to end the ongoing burnings of the Quran that have led to tensions with Muslim nations. The law, passed by a vote of 94 to 77, is primarily focused on protecting the safety of Danes while allowing criticism of religion. Violators could face fines or imprisonment for up to two years. The move follows a series of Quran burnings in Denmark and Sweden, leading to protests in the Middle East. The bill has received positive feedback from international players, but some opposition parties criticize it for giving in to pressure from Islamic actors. The law has a narrower scope than originally proposed, covering only scriptures of registered religious communities and the national church. Sweden is set to prioritize research on underwater technologies, such as mine countermeasures and submarine-related systems, in 2024. Saab, a Swedish defense prime, signed a contract with the country's defense acquisition agency to conduct concept development studies focused on new technologies for submarine-related capabilities. The study aims to secure underwater capabilities for Sweden and may influence Saab's ongoing work on the new Type A26 submarines for the Royal Swedish Navy. Sweden's naval capabilities, including experience in navigating the Baltic Sea, could be a valuable asset if its pending NATO membership is approved. Turkish President Erdogan stated that Canada and the United States are insisting on Ankara ratifying Sweden's NATO membership bid before Canada resumes exporting drone cameras to Turkey. Erdogan mentioned that the US and Canada are pressing for the NATO membership approval as a condition for lifting export controls on drone parts, including optical equipment. The issue is connected to Turkey's request to buy 40 Lockheed Martin F-16 fighters and 79 modernization kits, a $20 billion sale supported by the US administration but facing objections in Congress over NATO enlargement delays and human rights concerns. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak faces internal strife within the Conservative Party over a contentious bill regarding the deportation of asylum seekers to Rwanda. The proposed legislation, part of Sunak's effort to address the influx of asylum seekers arriving via small boats across the English Channel, has been criticised for breaching international and domestic laws. The issue underscores deep divisions within the party, reminiscent of the Brexit era, with some MPs pushing for a hardline stance on immigration, while others express concerns about disregarding international obligations and legal norms. Brazil is deploying troops along its border with Venezuela in response to Venezuela's plans to incorporate a disputed area controlled by Guyana into its territory. The Essequibo region, rich in oil, has been a source of contention since the 19th century, and tensions have escalated following a recent referendum in Venezuela, where over 95% of voters supported the government's claim to Essequibo. Venezuela's leader, Nicolas Maduro, has proposed measures to assert control over the area, prompting concerns across the region. Brazil is reinforcing its presence along the border, while Guyana has put its troops on high alert. South Korea's defense minister, Shin Wansik, has issued a threat of massive retaliatory missile strikes on the heart and head of North Korea in the event of provocation. The warning follows heightened tensions between the two Koreas over their recent spy satellite launches. North Korea launched its first military reconnaissance satellite on November 21, prompting condemnation from South Korea, the US, and Japan. South Korea announced plans to resume frontline aerial surveillance in response, and North Korea retaliated by restoring border guard posts. Both actions would breach a 2018 inter-Korean deal on easing military tensions.
The finalized Fiscal 2024 National Defense Authorization Act NDAA, totaling $874.2 billion, has been approved in conference, including authorizations for the AUKUS agreement with Australia and Britain. The NDAA also codifies a new nuclear mission for Virginia-class submarines and requires a comprehensive training program for Taiwanese troops. Additionally, it establishes a Special Inspector General for Ukraine aid and allocates funds for Ukraine's security assistance initiative. The bill is expected to face opposition, particularly from the House Freedom Caucus, as it removes certain amendments related to Pentagon policies and climate change executive orders. Hunter Biden, son of President Joe Biden, stated in a podcast interview that Republican attacks against him are part of a broader strategy to target his father's presidency. He claimed that the attacks aimed to destroy a presidency by inflicting emotional pain on the first family. Hunter Biden's comments come after a federal grand jury indicted him on nine charges related to taxes and spending on drugs, escorts, luxury hotels, and rental properties. He asserted that the attacks are an attempt to kill him, causing pain to his father. Hunter Biden has been under scrutiny for his business dealings and personal issues, including addiction. President Joe Biden remained silent on Friday regarding the deepening legal troubles of his son Hunter Biden. Hunter faces federal charges, including tax evasion and spending on drugs and escorts. While Hunter claimed Republicans were trying to kill him to harm his father's presidency, President Biden waved to reporters but ignored questions about the matter. The White House emphasized Biden's love and support for his son, stating that he is proud of him. Hunter Biden's legal issues come at a challenging time for President Biden, who is facing re-election in 2024 and dealing with other political challenges. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall has criticized the U.S. Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security BIS, for allegedly prioritizing trade with China over strict enforcement of export controls aimed at containing the geopolitical rival. McCall's 61-page report details a range of shortcomings, asserting that BIS has too readily approved the export of sensitive technologies to Chinese companies. The report calls for BIS to expand the types of technologies and companies it controls, adopt a clear denial policy for shipments of controlled technology to China, and renegotiate terms with China to allow better visibility into how licensed technology is being used.